And thank you for coming out on this uh, rather chilly, although not as chilly as some places, I guess, uh, May night. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Ghana people, the original custodians of uh, the land upon which we meet. Uh, well, thank you for attending. Um, we expect to make this the, the first of uh, a regular series of uh, guest speaker events, which we want to hold over a, a, a calendar year. Uh, but before I introduce our uh, guest speaker tonight, our spe very special guest speaker tonight, I'd just like to indulge a little bit to uh, tell you a little bit about the Entrepreneurship Commercialization and Innovation Centre, or as I would uh, more conveniently say, the ECIC. Uh, the ECIC is an education and research centre that focuses on project and new enterprise management. Uh, these activities may be commercial or not-for-profit. They may be formal or informal. They may be uh, uh, started by a, a single person or leading to complex social reorganisation. They could be originated with inside existing businesses. The ECIC distinctive competencies are providing management education and research that stretches across curriculum and disciplinary uh, areas and is not confined by the boundaries of business. Our primary multidisciplinary areas are project management, entrepreneurship and innovation and commercialisation. We take our mission very seriously here at uh, the ECIC. Uh, to stimulate innovation through our research, teaching and community engagement activities. Uh, so much so that we take a leading role in the University of Adelaide to facilitate entrepreneurship and innovation skills among the university's students and for that matter, all tertiary education students. We do this through hosting our e-challenge, the Zen e-challenge, sponsored by Zen Home Energy Systems. This year, the e-challenge is, is in its 11th year, and we are on target for another uh, record number of registrations and teams. We also manage the university's incubator facility out at Theberton campus. Uh, we're fledgling, fledgling research-inspired uh, and student businesses that can get low-cost accommodation and access support uh, to help them navigate the establishment and growth of new businesses. As part of our outreach to business and industry. We are delighted to welcome Professor Joram Bruce as our most recently appointed adjunct professor and chair of our external advisory board. Most of you may know Joram's work from his activity with the Thinkers in Residence office during 2011, where he was responsible for producing the Manufacturing uh, into the Future report, which I happen to have a copy here. Um, I've been privileged to work with Yeren uh, not only over the last 18 months or so, but over a good few years now. And uh, he never fails to provide fresh insights, uh, challenging ideas, and really stretches my own way of viewing the world. Yeren is someone I would refer to as a global thinker. Whenever I uh, get to, whenever my phone rings with Yeren's number, I'm never really quite sure where the call is going to be coming from. Which part of the globe is he in today? Um, quite aside from his role from, with us, he's uh, also the Honorary Professor at Warwick Business School in the UK. He's a Visiting Professor of Innovation Management and Business Model Innovation at VTT, Technical Research Centre in Finland. He's also the Visiting Professor of Intangible Asset Management and Performance Management at the Centre for Business Performance at Cranfield in the UK. Jörn has advised government bodies in UK, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Spain, Austria, and some may think it's the same, Australia. On issues that are relating to strategy, research and development, national and regional innovation systems, and knowledge management, and of course, intellectual capital. Jaren Roos is the founder of Intellectual Capital Services Limited, a leading think tank on technology and business futures. He's one of the founders and leaders in the modern field of intellectual capital science and is a recognised world expert in innovation management and strategy. He has published numerous books, articles and case studies uh, on these subjects and his consulting experience ranges across both public and private sectors in over 40 countries. That's why I never know where he's going to be calling from. 
If you could join with me, please, in uh, welcoming Professor Jeroen Roos, Roos for his first public lecture with the University of Adelaide, titled The Role of Universities in a Modern Regional Manufacturing Innovation System. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, thank you to the ECIC, which in my ignorance before I was told that, I tended to call ECIC, so that's all right. <coughs> I thought that was a, you know, better, had a better ring to it. Um, I, will, uh, I have the pleasure of talking to you about this issue about universities. And it is a, it's a really important issue for many reasons. One, of course, is that universities um, are in their own right a big entity. It's a big employer. It is a big budget. And it has in its own right a role in that place. But it's also a generator and uh, opportunity provider of knowledge and other services to the system. In combination with that role and these issues and the general financial environment in which we operate, uh, governments are putting more and more pressures on universities to become, uh, provide higher value than they already do to society. And, and that means we need to kind of question and start to understand the roles universities play and why they do them. And I will talk a little bit about this and during this presentation I will be positive about some things, I will be very critical about other things and I will compare and contrast those areas. So please note, it is a personal view. Right? So you have to take it for what it's worth. <clears throat> if you look at it, universities have four principal purposes that they can play in, in a region or a system or a society. Uh, there are three standing on their own, underpinned by one. So the first one is uh, provision of high quality education. Uh, actually, in, in a number of countries, that is its primary role. Its primary role is to educate. And it provides value through delivering um, students that are ready for the task that they are given. Right? So they have students that are well educated in whatever dimension that means. So they are work ready, whatever the work means. And that means that, that and I come back to that, that means that it has to be high quality education. And high quality education actually means that you have to have the right type of teachers providing education in the right way to the right type of students. And there has to be some tough rules around it. You know, failure is not tolerated and support has to be given. Uh, and I'll come back to that. And uh, you know, just to give you statistics, one, the one university in this country, doesn't matter which one, uh, is the world's largest education provider in one domain of knowledge, doesn't matter which one. It is its student to academic faculty ratio is 43 to 1. You tell me how it's possible to provide high quality education in an environment with 43 student to one academic staff, including those temporary staffs. What do we wish? We wish. Uh, and in some subject, yes, but not in subjects that require hand on hand guidance, which this one does. Right. So there's something about that. I'll say a bit more about that. The other one is <clears throat> how do we contribute to practice in public and private and third sector? In other words, part of what universities do is, is deliver knowledge that is being put to use. You know, we are providers of knowledge and that knowledge has to be put to use. So it goes from discussion points to the provision of practice so that firms and organizations start to use it. That's a really critical role. Uh, that means we can underpin what we say and say, we have studied these things, this causality leads to this, so if you start to do things this way, you will get this outcome. And hence, we have an impact on, on practice. The third one is a contribution to a grounded public debate. I mean, universities are full of quote-unquote expert knowledge. And uh, that means that we s universities have an obligation to intervene in debates if the debates is starting to provide claims that are ungrounded. It's, it's an issue of being a trusted provider of factual insights that are, if possible, if anything can be, somewhat unbiased, Ella, anyway. But to do all these things, we are underpinned by high quality research. And um, there is a lot of research, not all of which is high quality. There's a lot of education, not all of which is high quality. There's a lot of contribution to practice which don't necessarily work. And there's a lot of not very well grounded contribution to public debate. 
So these are, these are in a sense, the four roles. So <clears throat> if we start with the education side a little bit, uh, and I will come back to them a little bit later on as well, we want education that provides fit for purpose <coughs> educated individuals. Right? And, and what do we mean by that? That means that they, the people who come out of, a, of uh, this type of education should have three domains in which they have been given the opportunity to improve themselves. One is, of course, the, the knowing bit. You know, we're very good at that. We tell them, you know, I stood out there and looked at some torsion example being calculated in aerodynamic situations before we came in here, right? That's knowledge. We, we, you know, we study, we teach them how to do these type of things. And generally, universities are very good at that. The next thing is, that, is the doing. You know, how do we apply these things in practice? You know, what does it look like to use what you have learned in an environment of application? Universities as a whole tend not to be very good at that, as a rule. And the last one is the being. How do we convey to them the, the, the as we call it, to live honorable lives, right? That is the humanities tradition, which actually universities originate from, in, at least in the Western world, where it was very much around to live honorable lives. What does it mean in that area? And how much do we, do we provide that? I mean, that was the focus of all universities in the period 1400 to 1800 in the European environment. That was what it was about. <coughs> you may be aware of the debate that rages around business schools in the world, and it's more or less in the global financial crisis. And um, one of the things that has been visible is the decline in demand for business school education. In the US, out of the 30 top business schools, very, very few are able to fill their places. And that's of the 30 top one. Right? Uh, and there's been a study by Professor Dutta very much in, at Harvard why this is the case. And it boils down to basically those three things. And it boils down to number two and number three. We are not providing the MBAs with number two and number three. Hence, they are not fit for purpose in today's world. Hence, we are not willing to provide the education cost to send them there and they themselves are not willing to make that investment and that is that is really interesting because it means that somehow that domain of education has gone out of touch with what it is that society and its customers and its users want to have uh, and this is putting pressures on universities it, it is it, t it tells you that in a sense if you are educating with the purpose, for example, of making money, rather than educating with the purpose of providing fit for purpose students, you may end up having a very, very big problem. And if we look at universities today, we can all point at universities who are doing exceedingly well and universities who are not doing so well. And there are universities that have accelerated up whatever kind of ranking list you choose but they tend to have done it in two dimensions simultaneously. Ranking in the eyes of the hirers of the students simultaneously to increasing the ranking in the eyes of the academic community. I'll give you one example of a fantastic university that had done that over a very brief period of time and is now, according to the Leiden ranking, for example, number one in Europe. And that's the Ecole Fédérale Politique de Lausanne. That's the Swiss, one of the Swiss universities. And they actually come from a very low level over a very short period of time, come to the top of the ranking. And they've achieved top in two dimensions, academic ranking and industry perception of usefulness. Well, it's very interesting because those dovetail. And if we do this well, we will get a high demand for our students. In other words, they will be hired before they're finished. Right, that's high demand. Yeah, they will have a job before they leave. Right. They, we will have a queue of people coming to want to study, more than we have the capability to take on and the capacity. We will end up having lifelong relationships of learning with these people. They come back to us again and again and again. Right? They, we will have a highly active and participative alumni structure. They will interact with us in the school. These are classic examples of what it works. <coughs> when I took my first degree once upon a time, my master's in, in engineering, uh, that university had the principle that once you have left it, you are welcome to return at any time and sit in on any lectures totally free. The school is there for you as an alumna. If you want to take an exam, yeah, you will have to pay something. 
But if you just want to come there to, to further your learning, it's all available for you. Just come and sit in any time. Right? So it has this saying, you know, what you bought from us is a package. And it includes a lifelong relationship between you and us. <clears throat> we want to have high quality research. Yes, and there are more than one dimension to that one too. Of course we want to publicize in high quality journals, absolutely. But we want what we publicize to be seen as relevant by our peers. In other words, we want it to be cited. To be blunt, I don't really care if you publish one article in a top journal that nobody ever cites. It's completely irrelevant then. What I want is you to publish journals which cited 600 times. Well, that's the key. Now, interesting enough, with, with things like Google and so on, yes, we can have a view whether they capture all the citation or whatever, but Google Scholar gives you a number of citations. Uh, there are now universities that start to say that if you're going to apply for a full professorship, you need to be cited at least 100 times in at least one, one article. Otherwise, you can just go away. They don't care how many articles you published any longer. They just care if what you published was useful in the eyes of your peers. And I think we're going to see more and more of that because that's starting to penetrate the view that, that the government as a funder is looking to these things as well. We will see a drift from volume of article to relevance of articles. And that means we will take away the game we all play that, you know, if I need to publish 15 articles, I write one and I split it into 15, right? No, don't tell me you haven't done that one. You know, I have, so have most other people, all right? Uh, and we also can see it through high demand from contract research by key stakeholders. They will come to us and say, you are good, you are useful, I have a problem, please help me solve it and I will pay you for your assistance. But of course that means that we have to have ways that are easy to interact between these people. We can't have an IP contract that is 35 pages long and that will make it impossible for me as a company to make any use of what I've just paid you to do for me. Right? We have to have some balance in those type of issues. We will have a high level of international research cooperation. In other words, our peers around the world want to work with us because we are good at what we do. And we will have critical mass in our research teams. Now, depending on the domain, this will vary. But if you look at some of the sciences, research teams less than 15 don't have critical mass. You know, if you look at domains like biology and stuff like that, and just look at the number of co-authors of leading articles, we all know how that's gone up. And that means that the ability to work is no longer one person's ability, it's a team's ability. And that means we have to be very good at teamwork here. In this. I mean, you have the Photonic Center. I don't know how many researchers you have there, but probably a, a, in Photonic, a critical research team is probably 30 people. That type of a level, roughly. And, and that means we can't have one guy in a corner any longer. Uh, we have to have the ability to have critical mass to bring this forth. And that is quite tough, because that means that some things will no longer be done at a given university, because it doesn't have critical mass. In the contribution to grounded public debate, you know, there are a number of things. We, we have to be a trusted source of expert opinion. So in other words, if a journalist at deadline time, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night, finds that they have a problem that they don't understand. They should know how to contact somebody with that knowledge through <coughs> a university, knowing that they will, what they will get is a grounded insight without opinions, keeping to what is known about the subject. Um, I was part of a journey for an organization that, that took this very seriously. At that time, it was the equivalent of a, the DSTO in Australia, but in another country. They established a principle that there was lots of issues about what goes on with chemical gas, gas and what's happening in this environmental issue, whatever it is. So they said to the, the, they went out to all the newspapers and all the journalists and says, here is a number. You can call this number. Through this number, you will be directed 24 hours a day to whoever is the expert in the domain question you're looking for. That expert will tell you what is factually known and what is not known about the topic you ask. You can't give his name, but you can quote the organization as the source. And over less than 12 months, this became the most quoted source in TV news and journalists in this country because they had the credibility of knowing what they were talking about. And they never had an opinion. They only gave 
grounded facts, including we do not know this. Right. There is something about the fact-based intervention. So when you hear debates, for example, political debates, where people are banding things around, which turns out are factually incorrect. You stand up and you say, this is incorrect. Here are the correct things, whatever they may be. There's something about being methodologically sound, and that is tricky. Uh, for example, what, what industry and politicians and decision makers want is causality relationships. If this, then that. What a lot of research gives you is correlations. You know, this happens and then this happens at the same time. But we don't quite know whether this drives this or not. And, and there is in the public eye not a lot of knowledge about the distinction between the two. But it is a fundamental distinction. And we have to have an obligation to make that distinction and to say that we don't know. I mean, I, I so methodological soundness is very important. And also knowing whether we have you know, statistically relevant numbers and all this kind of stuff. And, and methodological <coughs> education is sometimes not as good as it should be in many areas. We also have to be proactive as well as reactive in this area of contribution. So sometimes we have to instigate the debate because it is missing. And because it may be very important. Because we know why it is important. And we have to have integrity and we have to be highly ethical in what we do. In other words, that means, among other things, telling people when we don't know. Yes, there has been a lot of research here, but it's inconclusive. It's a really important statement to make. We don't know. And of course we have to contribute to practice. And that means we have to know what you can do to improve your efficiency, what you can do to improve your effectiveness. And we have to look about options and risk reduction around this area so that firms and other organizations can do things, better things, in better way. And um, I take the opportunity here to correct a frequent misunderstanding about the concept of productivity. Uh, there is a commonly held view that productivity is primarily about cost reduction and work effectivization. That's uh, not correct. Productivity is about doing smarter things in smarter ways. That's most of what productivity is. You know, it's coming up with that opportunity that wasn't their thing and doing something or doing what you're doing now but in a much completely different way, which may not entail cost reduction per se or work effectivization per se, but it does drive productivity. <coughs> and then there is this wonderful confusion of the terms innovation and research. <coughs> Universities are incredibly good at research and less good at innovation. And the reason is they have never really been tasked with the latter. Mm. The research in a very simplistic expression is the conversion of money to knowledge. Uh, so I spend a bit of money, I do something, I find something out and I am lucky I produce it in some domain or other, so it's some, some knowledge. Innovation is the deployment of knowledge. I don't care whose it is, me, mine or somebody else's, and I package in a way that allows me to get value out. Sometimes that value is money, like in industry. Sometimes it's societal value, like in the third sector. But it's a, it's a fundamentally different thing. Uh, and one does not automatically lead to the other. Australia is a great example of that being the case. You are one of the highest investors in scientific research in the OECD world in terms of what you do. Uh, your relative return in terms of innovative outcome is among the lowest in the OECD world. Uh, in other words, there is no automatic link between the first and the second. Uh, because if there was, you would be incredibly good at providing valuable and value delivering innovations. You wouldn't have any problem with your manufacturing industry. You wouldn't have any problem with anything else because you pump a lot into science. And you, know, you want to see the effect of that. No, let's take an example. Of the last 10 years or so, the state of Victoria have invested I don't know, between 600 million and a billion in biotechnology related research by government, federal and local and state. And the original articulation of the intent was to build a great biotechnology based industry. So in other words, we invest in research, we will get innovation. What do they have to show for that? The answer is not very much. Great science, but not a lot of innovation. 
There is no automatic link between A and B. It's very complicated to go from A to B. It's high risk, it's incredibly difficult, it requires all the systems and structures to be there around it. One of the reasons you generally do not succeed in medical biotechnology-based firm building is you have no medical biotechnology-based pillar industries. <coughs> right? So what you do is you spend a lot of money and you get something up and down, and once it's up and running, you know, some of the existing firms swoop in nicely, pick them up for a song, and move them to wherever they have their center around Cambridge or wherever it is. So you're very happy because you started a company that you sold off, I'm a little bit more skeptical because I don't call it a company. I call it a research project with an ABN number. So <laughs> the, the, the taxpayers have subsidized the pipeline of the pharmaceutical company's research. Is that what you want to do with taxpayers' money? No. The other thing is the rate of return. So if I'm government and I'm looking at putting this money in here, Yes, I can go and do And there are numerous studies. And basically, they all say the same thing. They say that societal return on public money put into universities hovers around 30%. Right? You know, give or take 10, 20% 10, at this point, but it's around 30%. So it's not a bad investment. That's number one. It's not a bad investment. That's the good news. Okay? Bad news is that if you put it into things like the Fraunhofer of this world, you get 10 times the return. Why is that? Why are the Dutch version of Fraunhofer called TNA giving you a 300% return according to independent economic studies? Why is the Swedish one giving you 600%? Why is the Austrian one giving you 2,500%? Why is the Spanish and Finnish giving you very high return? Whereas the, you know, whereas the, this I think is the UK and the Finnish ones giving you 400% return. Why is the difference between the 30 and the 300? Where does it come from? It's a very important question, and it's a very important question to answer. So, um, the, I'll have a question, I'll have it for you later, but the bottom line is these organizations are made to solve problems for industry. That's what they are made for. Whereas universities are not made for that. Right? That's the distinction. The universities are made for something else. 30% is not bad. It's very good. But if I look at this from an industrial standpoint, 300% is better. Hmm? That's the key issue. And it requires different people you know, who do different things in different ways and different timelines. That's really important. So I'll come back to the logic around why that is and why this organization exists a bit later on. So what is university's contribution to the different component of a national innovation system? And, and let me try to, um, to talk that through. So the innovation system has a, has a number of components. The first one is issues about culture and people. How do we look about innovation? You know, do we like innovation? Do people want to do it? Or do they want to go and do sport? Okay? It's one of those type of issues. So universities are key contributors to the, the attitudes that we hold because we are in formative years when we are in universities. So are universities delving out the view that going there and putting your own knowledge to use is a good thing? No. So in other words, let me ask you the following thing as a university. Are you educating employees or are you educating employers? Huh? That's very important. Because if you say we are educating the employers of tomorrow, then you're talking about entrepreneurship, then you're talking about taking risks, then you're talking about encouraging people to go out and do something. Whereas if you are educating the employees of tomorrow, then you give them completely different things. And that's, that's part of that cultural role that a university can play. And I would say that a lot of Australian universities educate employees. They don't educate employers. There is something, of course, about the education and teaching, which is you know, your primary role. There's not a lot to say about that. That goes without saying. There's something about public and non-profit research, which, again, is a key role for universities. Again, goes without saying. There's something about <coughs> public good. In other words, government gives money to other things is sometimes that money also shared by the recipient with the university to achieve a good thing? And the answer is, that depends on the university. Right? 
So if you went with gave some money to a hospital and say, we want you to reduce the cost of running this hospital while simultaneously increasing the quality of the care, would they automatically turn around and come to the university and say, help me? Right? If the answer is yes, well, then you play a role in that. If the answer is no, then you don't play a role in that. So sometimes universities play a role in this. And again, it depends on the university very much and its attitude and who it is. Linkages, you know, this issue about linking with what happens at, at the university in terms of knowledge development and what can be developed in terms of economic or other social value creation. And universities are, in principle, a key contributor to that. Not all universities <coughs> do it, and not all universities do it well. Uh, and let me try to start then by dispelling a few myths, which we all know. One myth is that universities make money from IP. That's a myth. If you work out how much it costs you to manage your commercialization activities with all the associated paperwork for everybody involved in the universities, and then you look at what your IP revenues are, I think the research, rated research I have, that if you say that the requirement is university should continuously make money on the net for 10 years in a row to be qualified to say that they're good at this, you're down to about six universities in the world. And number one of that list is University of Florida because it holds the IP for Gatorade. Right. And by the way, if you have, in, in order to get to the six, I also remove those whose IP have not developed by the university, but donated tax efficiently by a company who didn't need to use it to that <coughs> university. So I remove those as well. Right. So in other words, this is not a good business case. It is, who should hold the IP? Of course, the entity with the highest potential to make economic benefit of it. Give it to them. I mean, I like the principle that some very large, famous universities have that they say, here's a nice IP, anybody wants to buy it? Uh, they go on for about 12 months and nobody says, no, nobody's interested, okay? Then they put it on the website, say, anybody for $500, fixed price, you know? And then, oh, nobody for 12 months says, okay, you can have it for free, right? <laughs> It's kind of Feline's basement model for those who you know the American system. You know, it kind of goes down and down. And actually, they have great success, and they have also a incredibly great success in educating their academics how, how highly improbable it is that their IP has any value. <laughs> because that is very important. <coughs> you know, the number of academics who think I come up with the rescue of the world and says this is worth at least one billion, and they go and talk to the recipient company and say, I'll give you $150. Yeah? And, you know, and there is a bit of a mismatch in expectations on both sides in those type of discussions. And by doing these things, you get it very visible. Then there's something about clusters. Clusters are frequently misunderstood. Clusters are, generally speaking, not ten people who make pianos that happen to work together, because they can't. They're competing, right? It's about groups of firms who draw on the same knowledge domain in order to then achieve something and can benefit from it. A university are frequent participate in this because you are a source of knowledge. But you're not only a participant and important in that role, you're also an instigator, and that is not to be underestimated. You are an instigator in the opportunity to develop industrial activities towards different domains with a given domain underpinning. That's very, very important. But that requires you to reflect on that. I mean, let me take another example. I think most people would agree that the knowledge in the domain of biotechnology is very high in the research environment of Australia. It's extremely high. What do you apply it to? Mostly medical and associated areas. And that is not where most of the money is, if I'm blunt. It's actually not even where most of the societal value may be. Right? There's lots of value in industrial application of these things. So why don't we see almost anything of that? Well, let me give you a scenario. We have two eminent researchers on a cocktail party, barbecue, whatever it is, right? And, you know, so they go out there, and they all put good-looking, and, you know, some other good-looking person come up to them and say, what do you do, okay? Researcher one says, I work on the solution to cancer. I am here to save mankind. The other one says, I make energy out of shit. <laughs> Who do you think stand the proudest? <coughs> Who will have the societal admiration? as opposed to who makes the money. <coughs> yeah. So there is an issue about, do we give people that too much freedom in applying the domains of knowledge to areas which may be very interesting, but may not necessarily <coughs> generate a good? Can we afford that? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. 
There's something about being a lead customer. <clears throat> in other words, universities in their own right are large enterprises. We agreed that earlier on in this presentation. That means you buy things. You, know, you have a not insignificant procurement budget as an, as an economic entity. Do you use that procurement budget to drive up new things that previously wasn't there? That could enable somebody to deploy the knowledge that came out of your university for an economic activity? Or do you buy cheapest possible? That's a very interesting question. Because actually, if you do the latter, you have an internal contradiction in terms. No? Are you actually enabling the deployment of the knowledge that you have developed by providing an economic opportunity for somebody to develop a functioning solution to a problem that you may have that they can then leverage elsewhere? No? If you do, great. And there are some universities that do. If you don't, well, then in a sense you've told them that, you know, we don't expect you to ever to put any use out of the things we do here. Because we are not interested in helping you to do that. Just to put a perspective, perspective on it. And of course there's something about international links where universities has an opportunity to play a larger role. And then there are a couple of other things where, you know, you're not quite there. Risk finance is an interesting one. Most countries in the world suffer from a deficit in things like venture capital. So does Australia. So there is a constant requirement for more money. Uh, and then there are universities, for some obscure reason, they have money that they can hand out because they get donated money. And then I talk about that and then I get the comment here. We do not have a culture of giving money to universities in this country, people tell me. I would claim that that is wrong. I claim that that's wrong because I think there's a misunderstanding who actually gives money. The guy who leaves the university spends 20 years in his career to become CEO of a large corporation. Don't donate money to his university. He mentally says, I did this. University had really nothing to do with it. Right. The guy who comes out of the university with the assistant of the university start a company immediately and becomes IPO after three years, he says, thank you to the university, and he gives him a million back. So universities with large purses are universities with high entrepreneurial activities out of students, not out of academics, out of students. And those are the people who benefit the, by the university will quickly donate money back. So if you want a big purse, make students start a company. They will love you. That's critical. And there is a role the university can do here, but the whole Australian system is set up to, to help spin-offs by academics. And if I'm blunt, most academics didn't become academics to take risks and become entrepreneurs. You know? That's kind of a, not what they did in the first case. You know, there are exceptions, but on the whole, not what they want to do. You know? The people are willing to take risks are students. They have little risk. You know? And they're great. They have full of ideas. And if we are lucky, they may drag away an academic for 5% of his time so he can still keep his job but want to finger in the little game to use his things. And that's, that's great, all right? And now we have a startup company. And then we have a few filters and a few other things to make this work. And then we have the, the circle starting to tick. And then we're all right. So, there are many things in the innovation system, and universities can play very many roles in this. Now, let me come back to a minute around the difference between that issue about return of 30% and return of 300%. The... Um, <coughs> And let me look at the world from a small company's perspective, an SME. And they, they, they have three time horizons. You know, my present offering, what I'm selling now, what I'm going to sell tomorrow, which I'm playing with a little bit, and then what I'm going to do sometime in the future. And my effort, money plus time and all these things, is the green curve. So I spend most of my effort on what I do now, a little bit on the next one, and almost nothing on what I do in the future. If I plot a good research university in this curve, I get the red curve. Because his role is to push the future. That's what it does. That's what your role is. Right? And that means you spend very little time about what goes on now in this area. That's not interesting. That was studied a long time ago. Right? So what you can see is there is a very large gap, which is why it's almost impossible to get an SME and a university to sit down and talk to each other. What do you have in common? Right? You know, the value you can get out is very, very low. So there is a gap in the middle, and the middle is a very special problem area. The middle is the problem area of, of enabling, you know. How can I, so I have this new biosensor to take the biology, which I put together with my stuff in my lab. Now I'm going to go out and produce it, but it's a new thing. So there are no production tools around out there that I can buy off the shelf. 
who do I turn to to help me build the production line of this new thing for which there are no equipment to buy off the shelf? Do I go to a university? No. Universities don't operate in that space. This is the space where these other organizations were created to operate. And that is why their return is so incredibly high. It's a very quick win to operate in that domain. But it requires you have two people who understand that domain, who's been out in the companies, who have that background, who have the scientific insight, and who can stretch into the universities, get the knowledge, understand it, convert it to what is necessary because they understand what the world of the company is, and put it to an immediate deployable solution. And you have to have that skill. So when you go, so you can't be like when you go to CSRO and say, here is my widget, I need to reduce its cost by 15% and I need it by Friday six weeks. And they start a research project. That's not what it's about. <coughs> huh? It's about having the knowledge to know exactly how you attack that, now flexible and with a deliverable. And that's a different type of an issue. That's the foundation where you have 30% return, very high, very good on the right, and 300% return in the middle. And universities that start to stretch into the middle do very well return-wise. And the difference between an SME and a large corporation like a BHP is that the green curve stretches all the way straight out, well past enabled before it starts to bend down. In other words, the overlap between universities and large firms is much larger than the overlap with small firms, which is why universities are normally very comfortable working with the BHPs of this world. And that means we need to understand what it takes and the role that the university plays in an SME. This is the success criteria from SMEs in, in high-cost countries, of which Australia has now won, given you the third most expensive country to operate in the world in the manufacturing environment after Switzerland and Norway. Right? You used to be 2008, you were lower in the US. Now you're the third most expensive. So what does it take to succeed? And there are a number of things, but I'd like to point at two specifically. On your lower left in this little cycle, you have two words, two things. One is integrated innovation. In other words, the ability to deploy new knowledge to create whatever these new solutions. Universities are a provider of that new knowledge. So an, in, an interaction and a knowledge of what goes on in universities and maybe a contracting of a user to develop that knowledge is very important. The second one is these firms generally are very knowledgeable in their own narrow niche domain. So that's not where they get surprised but they risk getting surprised to the level of being killed off by something appearing, appearing in a domain that they don't know and they're not playing in. For example, they work very hard with machine tools doing machining or metallics and suddenly additive manufacturing turns up 3D printing, which they don't know anything about. And they may not notice it unless somebody tells them. So frequently they have very long-lasting relationship with universities, 10 years on average, where the purpose is not to exchange a lot of money, it's a little bit, but the role of the university is to get to know the firm so they can say, hey, something is happening over here. You should start looking at that because in three to five years, it may impact your business. So they use university as a red flagging activity to assist them. That's a very valuable role a university can play to facilitate the risk exposure of an otherwise very narrowly but very knowledgeable firm. And that's frequently misunderstood uh, from both sides. Now, <coughs> having had some experience from observing and partaking in many universities in Australia in education activities, I have a few reflections. First reflection is, I actually think that many young people partake in education that ought not to exist. It is a waste of space and a waste of time. Right. Quality is just appalling. Right. Students and their parents, frequently, are making their life's investment by making a choice of what their children study and what they study themselves. We have to be very respectful of that. Governments are investing heavily in academic education, and that's taxpayers' money. We have to be very respectful of that. And the reason is that this educated student, with some luck, will take part in creating the future Australia and the future Australia's destiny. You know, it's tomorrow's people we're talking about, right? And these investments should not be wasted on education with low quality. 
I don't know what the top university in Australia has in ratio, but I hover proper, probably hover around one to ten or something, you know, in that area. If it's really, really good in terms of student per academic staff, I would assume something like that. If I go to the top university in the country I come from, it's three academic staff per student. That's a big difference in the quality you can provide. Hmm? So the question we have to ask ourselves is that, is it right to keep providing education that is not good enough? I have been in classes where I can guarantee you that half of the class did not understand a world, word of what I was saying. Yes, my English is not perfect. I'm not a native speaker. But they did not understand a word of what I was saying. Their English, their verbal English was just not there. Written, yes. Verbal, no. Will these people get a degree? Yes, they will. Is that good for them? Is that good for the university? Question mark. What have you done to education, ladies and gentlemen? By looking at it as a commodity whose quality you don't care about, as long as it gives you the income that you need, to keep playing with research. Right? How do you get excellent education? Well, the answer is not difficult. What do we know? You get it because you have research active and research intensive teachers with a high interest in students and their academic success. These are not frequently found, but they are key people. Teachers with the courage to push students to develop further, but also with the courage to fail poorly performing students. Right. This approach is to be supported by university management and administration, not the opposite approach. Anybody tells me that a program delivers 100% past students. That is impossible. There is something wrong if that's the case. You either have brought in geniuses to study, right, or you just don't care and just give them the result. I have a real problem with this when I walk around Australia. So what are the challenges that I would put up for the education system? The first one is that the key is education and it's built on very good research. It's not research that's <laughs> built on education. It's about flip-flopping the view. Teaching is not a punishment. It is a privilege. Right. Teaching should be career enhancing, not career limiting in how you do these things. Industry is a core beneficiary of university efforts, not solely a source of funding. You know how, how cynical you have made industry as relates to how you as a university behave. Their view is, oh, well, they only come out there and give us a lot of promises to get our money and then we never see them again uh, until there's some useless delivery at the end. That's literally what they say. That's not a good thing. Uh. Working with industry, whatever it is, it can be private sector, third sector, I don't care, should be career enhancing, not career limiting. Right. Excellent industry outcomes can coexist with excellent research outcomes. There is no contradiction between the two. Huh? You are a sizable organization with large research and many people. You have to adapt to the small firms who have neither resources nor the people to do so. Whereas the multinational enterprise can adapt to you. And you have to increase the people exchange between university and firms both ways. Yes, universe, in the research and industry is a great program. Where is the industry people in universities program? You know? How many adjunct people have you got from industry who come in and help you in the laboratory issues? How many adjunct people have you come in that becomes tutors to assist on the side the, the students to write the applied uh, theses they have to write? Forget the adjunct professors, they're just an oddity. You know, I'm one of them. It's obscure people, all right? Go for all the other useful people who are adjunct that you can bring in from, from industry to do all kinds of things. 
So, so increase that, that crossover area both ways. It's very important. I mean, we have one poor person sitting up that I know with an industry background who is trying to exist in an academic world. It's not an easy job. You have my full sympathies, all right? So, my challenge to you as a generic university, not to you as an Adelaide university, but to a generic, generic university, is to prove to me and to others that you can be a major contributor to creating industrial success in the present high operating cost industrial environment in South Australia and Australia generally. Can you actually make a difference? Or are you going to sit on the sideline? And just look as the rest crumbles and collapses. Because things will get much, much worse out there before it gets better. And with that challenge, I say thank you and I'm quite open to any questions, critique. You don't have to agree. It's a personal opinion. Thank you very much.